what happened to him. LeBron James, LeBron James. Or them. Or him. Let me see what you have. I'm no! I think about it at least once a week. Like, how are they doing? Did they get over the momentary fame or is it their entire personality? Did they get stopped in the streets? Are people just constantly doing impressions of them? I can't imagine what it would be like to have the world's perception of who you are being based on a 15 second video. Like, I'm sorry to the LeBron James kid, but he will always be the LeBron James kid to me. I don't even know his real name and I'll probably never bother to learn it. Oops. The desire to be known and recognized by others is a common part of the human experience. And usually we identify people by using outward factors like ethnicity, gender, and looks, and also things like job, family status, and accomplishments. But sometimes we can have our not so finest moments used as our key identifiers. Like to this one soccer team I played against as a kid, I was the defender that scored on our own net. It was an accident. To the barista at the coffee shop I was at last week, I was the customer who pulled the door instead of pushing it on my way out. Oh, looks like you pushed. And to most of you, sadly enough, I'm the girl from Red Deer. Actually, I'm probably just the pastor who dunks on Red Deer every time she preaches. On a more serious note, our identities are a crucial part to each of us. That's because our identity shapes the way we feel about ourselves. It brings about a sense of belonging and purpose. It helps us express who we believe ourselves to be, inwardly and outwardly. So imagine our identities then being shaped by the epic fail compilation of our own lives. That wouldn't be great. Yet this is such a common phenomenon. Many of us at times find ourselves holding the weight of the not so great things about us and making that the core of who we are. We can carry around shame over past mistakes, insecurities, and lies that people have placed on us, or we've come to believe about ourselves, and we allow those things to dictate our identity. And this is a problem because ultimately, it means those things, those negative things, aren't just shaping us on the inside, but they can also influence our actions and behaviors. Maybe the abuse or mistreatment you've suffered because of someone else's actions has led you to be closed off to deep relationships and being vulnerable with people. Maybe a crippling addiction has led you to isolate yourself from the people around you. The pattern we can see here is that the proximity of these hurts and wounds to our identity Identity affects how we live our lives. Now you might be wondering, am I just supposed to get over everything I've been through? I can't just forget about the ways I've been hurt or have hurt other people or screwed up. There's no on and off switch for pain. I know, and trust me, if there was, I'd be the first one to use it. But that's not what I'm saying. Yes, the reality of sin entering the world means that we will likely feel the weight of our mistakes, our hurts, and our past throughout our lives here on earth. But the good news is that they don't have to be our identity. In fact, God can actually use all of the bad things we've done and gone through to strengthen us and give us hope. If there's one Bible hero who had every right to carry around the shame of her past, it would have been Rahab. In her debut to the Old Testament, she is introduced as a prostitute named Rahab. And this title seems to follow her later on when she's referenced to in parts of the New Testament. I couldn't even fathom having the deepest sin of my past being the way that people remember me for thousands of years. That's definitely not how I would want to be known because there's so much more to me than the things that I'm not proud of. And there's so much more to Rahab as well. Where we may initially see a woman with a troubling past, if we take a deeper look, we can see a courageous and heroic woman whose mistakes and sin are fully redeemed by God. Rahab's story is recounted in Joshua 2. In this chapter, a man named Joshua is leading the Israelite people to the land God promised them, now that his predecessor, Moses, had died. Here's what it says in the first seven verses. Okay, here we go, Abby, you can do it. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout the land on the river side of the Jordan, sorry, up a little more, okay, there's good. I actually am wondering. Chapter 2. Rahab protects the spies. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, Bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. 
Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Now, why does it matter that Rahab protected these spies? Well, on a practical level, her actions helped the spies gather information about the city of Jericho before an attempt to take over the land. It also affirmed God's promise that the Israelite people would gain victory over Canaanite nations. Because this woman, who would have been considered as an outcast and definitely not someone who would have had a significant role in the trajectory of history, because she was willing to risk everything and hide the spies, Israel would be reminded that God was with them and that they could trust him to follow through. And not only did she impact history for Israel, but also for herself and her own family. Here's what she says later in Joshua 2, 12 and 13. Now swear by me to the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brother and sisters and all their families. Then the spies respond by saying, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety. The men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. And that's exactly what happens. When the Israelites eventually attacked Jericho, Rahab and her family were spared and brought out of the city unharmed while the rest of it was destroyed. And throughout the Bible, we can see the redemption of Rahab take place. In Hebrews 11.31, she is listed as a hero of the faith. It says, It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. In James 2.25, her courage is highlighted. It says that she was known to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. And lastly, one of the coolest ways we see her redemption story played out is in Matthew 1, where her name is listed in the ancestry of Jesus not as Rahab the prostitute, but as Rahab. We all have things in our lives that we aren't proud of, but those things don't have to define us because our true identity comes from God. Because of him, we aren't defined by our past. Our identity is given to us by the God that redeems us. Quick little hair change and outfit change, but I did try to keep it as consistent as possible with the black and uh, with the white. But thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Um, yeah, as, men, as Ruben mentioned earlier, we are kicking off a new series called Heroes and Zeros, where we're going to be looking at different people whose stories are in the Bible. You know, some who were great people and some who were not so great people. Some people who had really humble beginnings and excelled and are who we would consider to be Bible heroes. And some who started off strong and honestly just failed quite miserably. And, you know, it's not just about sharing these stories for the sake of just sharing them, but, you know, we can actually learn so much from them. Some of them are maybe a little bit more on the inspirational side, and some will be more so a cautionary tale. And we do that so we can see how God's power was at work. And when we look at the story of Rahab specifically, as we will be tonight, we can see that there's so much we can glean, so much we can draw from and apply to our own lives. So here we have this woman whose sin followed her as a label throughout the Bible. She was a sex worker and she engaged in sexual activity outside of God's intended design. That doesn't really seem like it should be on the resume of a Bible hero. You know, I think sometimes we have this untrue perception of people in the Bible or just Christians in general where we think that they need to be like squeaky clean or perfect and as a result of that, that's why God loves them and that's why good things happen to them. And I'll just tell you right now that that is so far from the truth. You know, Rahab wasn't perfect. Jeff isn't perfect. R Reuben isn't perfect. I love Brett, but he's not perfect. <laughs> and he'll be the first to tell you that. You know, every person on this stage that's sung tonight, they're all great. They're not perfect. Every person that's behind the scenes, the greeters uh, and the hosts in the lobby, Again, they're, they're all great, but they're, they're not perfect. And me, 
I'm far, I'm far from perfect. Sometimes I cut corners and get jealous of other people. I can be greedy and complacent and rude and selfish and that's just skimming the surface. We'd be here all night if I was just airing out my dirty laundry. But I'm not sharing that with you to communicate that it's okay to do those things because it's not and through God's strength and his grace, I continue to work through those things in my life and if you're a Christian, I would hope that you would be doing the same thing as well. But what I want you to understand is that our deficiencies don't disqualify us from God's love or his purpose for our lives. In the New Testament of the Bible, one of the early founders of the church, his name is Paul, he wrote a letter to a church in a city called Corinth. And he really eloquently phrases this idea. After talking about all of these crazy intense events that he went through and endured for the sake of spreading God's message, like in constant danger, without food, water, shelter, people just trying to kill him, just to name a few. And that's, that's pretty heroic, you would think. I, I would personally probably flex if that was me, but after all of these crazy things he goes through and he describes, he then says this. That experience is worth boasting about but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from, to, from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Now, we don't exactly know what this thorn in Paul's flesh is that he's talking about, other than that it was a metaphor. So it could have been some type of physical or spiritual or emotional affliction that, regardless of what it was, it caused him a lot of challenge and hardship as he was continuing this ministry of spreading the word of Jesus throughout the land. And so he continues by saying this. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God's grace was all that Rahab needed. And in the ways that she fell short, God's power was shown. If we consider the context of the spies who are trying to scout out the land that they're one day going to take over, you know, hiding in the house of a prostitute was actually kind of a smart move. You know, think about it. There wouldn't there have been a lot of suspicion because there would have been a lot of people coming in and out. And we learn later on in Joshua 2.15 that Rahab's house was situated on a city wall. So the men would have had a pretty easy escape route, uh, as you can see in the picture that will come up on the screen. See, they have like a little like Rapunzel moment. It's great. So Rahab's life circumstances were actually essential to the advancement of the story. Maybe you find yourself thinking that because of where you're at in life, because of the things you're dealing with, that you'll never be good enough, you'll never be a good enough Christian or worthy of God's love and blessings. And friends, I hope you know that that is such a lie. You know, the amazing thing about God is that he meets each of us where we're at. He meets us right in the middle of our mess, right in the thick of it. He invites us to step out of that and into the life that he has for us. You know, he doesn't hate you because of the sin that you're wrestling with or because of the mistakes you've made, even like those really, really bad ones. He will never love you any more or any less than he does right now. And nothing will ever change that. And when we make that choice to leave behind the shame of the past in exchange for God's freedom, we no longer act out of our insecurities. Shame unfortunately, is a really powerful thing. Shame shackles you. It tells lies to the deepest parts of you. While guilt, guilt says, hey, you made a mistake. Shame says, you are a mistake. 
and that causes us to lose sight of the identity that we have in God. What I admire so deeply about Rahab is that her actions were not informed by shame, but rather her courageous choice to hide the spies, that was a result of her faith. And if anything, that's the most, most important part about her, not her shortcomings. Obviously, there would have been a really big risk in taking in those spies and aligning herself with her people's enemy. But what's so beautiful is that her growing faith and understanding of who God is is what guides her. Later in Joshua 2, she's talking to the spies about how she knew that there was this God that the Israelite people followed and he performed all of these incredible signs that the Israelite people were able to witness. She talked about how God parted the Red Sea so that the Israelite people could walk through it and escape years, centuries of slavery from the Egyptian people. And we actually just talked about that whole story um, in our last series. So if you didn't get the chance to hear it, you can hop onto our YouTube page or our Spotify and listen to it, watch it. It was really great and informative. And so she had an inclination about the incredible power of God. And she knew that if she took the risk, he would protect her, that God would protect her, and he did. More specifically, God spares her and her entire family from the destruction of their city, the destruction of Jericho. He saves them and redeems them. And God labels her not with her title as a prostitute, but labels her with his grace, as his child, as his daughter. So as we reflect on that idea that we aren't defined by our past because our identity is given to us by God, the God that created us, the God that loves us, the one that has a plan and purpose for our lives. I just invite you to think about you know, what those things are that you're allowing to form and shape your own identity. What labels have you given yourself? What other labels have people given you? What past mistakes or hurts? What personal insecurities have been leading you to carry around shame? I've never been a science person. It did not come very easily to me in school. I know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and that's why I became a pastor, because the knowledge just really ends there. Um, and I remember one day in my high school biology class, my teacher, he was handing a quiz back, and when he brings me my quiz, he made some comment about how it looked like I had finally applied myself. And it wasn't necessarily what he said, but it was how he said it. And it was in a way that made me feel embarrassed and humiliated, and he was not being encouraging in that moment. And the comment, it was loud enough for all of my classmates in close proximity to hear, and I just remember feeling just getting warmer and warmer, my face is turning more red, just gradually as I'm looking at the sheet of paper that I got handed back, which actually I think I did pretty good, but I look around and I realize to my horror that like all of my friends did in fact hear it and they're all just looking at me with shock, like what just happened? And I just wanted to sink in that moment. I just felt so embarrassed and I felt like my teacher thought that I was stupid and now my classmates also thought the same thing. And so I just did my best to continue in that class uh, that day. But this experience, it contributed to a really deep-seated lie that I actually still struggle with today, that I'm not smart. And whenever I've shared that with people, they're usually shocked, which I take as a compliment. I don't know if it's the glasses or what it is. But um, throughout college and even now in grad school, if there's a big assignment that I need to do, even if I know I can do it, you know, I usually just get a lot of anxiety to the point where it's crippling. It's not that I'm lazy or intentionally trying to put it off, but it's because deep down, I just don't think that I'll do well. Deep down, I don't feel smart, which again is silly because generally I did pretty good in college and I'm doing well in school now, but I just think it's so interesting how a lie that has no evidence other than the fact that a teacher humiliated me years ago is something that I still continue to carry and work through to this day. Another area of my life that has caused me to struggle with identity is relationships. To start off, I didn't really get to observe many healthy marriage relationships growing up, so when the time came for me to be my own, I just really did not know what I was doing. And so a mixture of hurt uh, that I afflicted on guys, hurt that was inflicted upon me, 
led me to believe that I wasn't capable or worthy in being in a loving and stable and healthy partnership. Now, because of the bad choices that I've made in the past and the overall lack of trust that I have in men, you know, I just couldn't, couldn't be lovable. And I don't share that with you to trauma dump or to make you feel sorry for me, please don't. Um, but I wanna show you the power in explicitly calling out those things. As you name them, they lose their power and their control over you. And that opens the door into stepping into God's freedom. And what is that freedom? You know, it's the hope that we receive through God's love for us. More specifically, when sin entered the world, there was a separation between God and humanity. And people used to have to rely on these laws recorded in the Old Testament of the Bible. That's the first half of the Bible that was written before Jesus was born. They would rely on those laws as their moral compass. But that didn't grant freedom. It was through the death of Jesus, who was a perfect and blameless man, that served as a way to pay for all of humanity's sin and mistakes. And because he died and came back to life, we believe that he defeated death and simultaneously tore down the wall that separated us from God. That freedom is knowing that one day we will be reunited with God in perfect harmony and we will get to experience the complete fullness of his love for us. And the cool thing is that while we're here on earth, actually, we can also experience a taste of God's freedom. And I actually wanna invite you to do that in a really specific way tonight. So hopefully if you came in, uh, you were able to get a little sticky note and a pen if you weren't. Once we go back into worship, you can feel free to just grab some just in the back corners there. And what I want you to do, once we get things rolling, you take your sticky note, take some time to just sit, reflect on what's been shared tonight, and think about those things that have been forming your identity and maybe it's a negative thing. Maybe it's something that, a lie that someone has placed on you, a past mistake, just a circumstance that was just beyond your control, whatever it is, I want you to think about those things. And if that burden of shame is on you because of those things, I'm really sorry, and I want you to know that there is freedom from that tonight. And all I want you to do is just is write it down. If there's one thing, write one thing. If there's 20 things, write, get another sticky you note know, if you want. Write as many things as you need to. And I just encourage you, you know, part of me was like, ah, oh, this feels really like summer camp. But I think that there can be a lot of power in doing these types of things and just taking a second to just reflect, to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with our friends, to be honest with God. And like I said, you know, God has so much grace for you and that he's not gonna come down on you with judgment, but love, ready to meet you in the thick of your mess. And so I just want you to write those things down. Maybe you need to talk it out and pray as the music's playing. Maybe you just need to let the words that we sing wash over you. Whatever it is, the space is open for you. But when you're ready, and once you have those things written down, we'll have some garbage cans at the front. And uh, I just want you to put those things where they belong which is in the garbage. Uh, you can crumble it, you can rip it, you can dunk it in there, I don't really care, but I need you to just put it where it belongs, okay? And um, you know, I have mine, that's a, that's a candy wrapper. I have my sticky note here too, and I'm sure there's many more things I could have written on it. But I have things too that I'm working through. I'm, I, won't, I won't hide that. So take those things, reflect, pray. Maybe you even need to share with a friend that's next to you, someone who can, can be continued encouragement for you. Do what you need to do, but when you're ready, just take it, take it and toss it in the trash. Let me pray and then we'll continue on with this response. God, we thank you. We thank you that we can find our identity. We can find peace in you. We can find strength in you. We can find purpose to live this life in you. And whatever we need to just be honest about tonight, Father, would we just do that? We do exactly that. It doesn't need to be a complicated thing. 
we just need to be real. And so I just pray for authenticity in this room. If there's something that we're struggling with, would we just bring it to you? The God that has a plan for each of us. The God that wants to walk alongside us as we work through those things. And we thank you that by your son, Jesus, we have the ability to have the shame removed from us that we no longer have to be the labels that people have placed on us, that we've placed on ourselves. I don't have to be stupid or incapable or dumb or whatever those things are, but that in you we can be loved and chosen and accepted and wanted and valued and cherished beyond So Lord, please just do only, what only you can do today that no sermon or no music can do. But Lord, would you just speak to our hearts and just continue to transform them? Everybody said, amen. Awesome. So if you didn't get a sticky note, they'll just be in the back corners there for you. Take some time, reflect, and whenever you're ready, put those lies in the garbage where they belong. <laughs> <laughs>